Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we hope that you are enjoying the conference. And now, this session entitled Mobility Trends from Mobility as a Service to Autonomous Driving. Here we have our three speakers. And to start with, to warm up, uh, let's see a little, a few slides. Here you have the number of slides, so just seven slides. Uh, I'm going to introduce then the speakers, and the speakers will make the, their presentations. So here we see, let me, let me see if this works also. Yes? Is this, is this working? Yes? Because, is this working? Yes? Is working? Yes. Because I see that uh, we don't have the pointer there. So let me show you in this slide how vehicles, how we expect vehicles to be in the next decade. No? So how will vehicles be soon? Electric. All of us have been here in many conferences and many people uh, agree to that. Norway, for, in Norway, 40% of the vehicles now are electric. So it seems that vehicles are going to be electric. But we have to face new issues related to that. For instance, here we can see the curve of the, uh, of the instantaneous demand of energy in Spain. Here we have the link in one day, okay? So, and you can upload this, you can download this data, it's available. Uh, looking at that, we see that this is a normal day, a day, uh, day in, in, the, in the week, a week, a week day, and we can see here that from one to seven, more or less, we are sleeping, most of us, and we don't consume energy. And we have the peak of the demands, okay? So, electric vehicles are expected to help to uh, make this curve more efficient, okay? So make this curve more efficient thanks to the uh, vehicle. Vehicles are expected to be charged during these uh, valleys, during these uh, periods, where the energy is cheaper, okay? So, and then during the peak hours, they can also uh, help us to reduce these peaks because we can take uh, the energy from the vehicles, okay? So this, this is the goal, this is the, the idea. We have to face all these issues. We need more charging points. Not, now in Spain, for instance, we don't have enough charging points. So if we want people to buy and to be confident to have electric vehicles, we need more charging points. We need incentives from the government. No taxes, for instance, uh, and so on. Reduce the prices, increase autonomy, better batteries, recycle batteries. So the lifetime of the batteries, 10 years. So what do you, we do with these batteries? Maybe the batteries could be used as a, an accumulator of energy in other places, like in charging stations, for instance, or at homes. But we need to, or governments need to uh, think of uh, policies uh, to solve these new issues that we are going to have. And a smart grid. Why not vehicles can talk with the smart grid and be used as a, a battery of energy to be used later, okay? So we have all these uh, issues to face if we want electric vehicles to be uh, a reality in the near future. Connected. We all expect that vehicles will be connected. If vehicles are connected, then we can have a very uh, wide uh, number of new services that are going to be very useful, for instance. They can be used to reduce uh, the number of uh, accidents, uh, to in improve the road safety. For instance, here we can see if a vehicle, thanks to the sensors of the vehicle, notices that, uh, that the vehicle has, uh, has had an accident, the vehicle itself can warn the vehicles around using the capabilities, the ca connection capabilities, vehicular ad hoc networks or 5G C2X uh, ca connectivity, for instance, eh? so that other vehicles can avoid this accident. So uh, it's a good uh, uh, benefit for improving road sa safety. And other services also. The vehicle will be electric and connected and connected with the smart grid. So for instance, we can imagine, we can design uh, services where the vehicles communicate to their infrastructure of the city, roadside units, can communicate the state of the church of the vehicles to an uh, MMS, that stands for Electromobility Management System, so that in a centralized way we can know which is the state of the fleet of electric vehicles in the city. And then we can foresee which are the necessities to charge these vehicles. 
Okay, looking at this, uh, re remember the, the previous slide with the graph of the demand of energy, and uh, including uh, big data algorithms or machine learning algorithms, we can foresee which are the necessities of uh, energy in our vehicles. We can, in the charge stations, we can, for instance, the maximum capacity of energy that we allow vehicles to charge, we can make it dynamic, depending on the necessities of the smart grid. So we can design a huge uh, uh, different uh, kind of services in these uh, scenarios, okay? But oh, and, and using also big data analysis and so on. Eh? So, but we have to face new problems, privacy is issues, for instance. Eh? So if vehicles are connected and the smart grid knows a lot of things for us and we, our vehicle sends information to the infrastructure, there's a privacy issue here. But maybe users want to give data if they receive a benefit. And up to a number, you, you are, uh, we are will, willing to share our, our data if we receive a benefit. Mm? But we can control. The, the important thing is that we can control what kind of information and how much information we share. Huh? Connected, electric, connected, and autonomous. OK, this is more difficult, no, maybe? Autonomous vehicles. Here in the, in the conference, we have several examples of autonomous vehicles, autonomous buses. Uh, so uh, if our vehicles are going to be autonomous in the next two decades, we have to face a lot of uh, new um, technical issues, no? LiDAR, camera sensors, artificial intelligence, big data analysis. We need infrastructure, so Internet of Things. We need a new smart city infrastructure. Uh, and also we have cyber security issues, but we also have benefits. Road safety would improve, notably, and we can design new mobility services, share vehicles, okay? So here in the conference, we have seen a lot of examples and people that are uh, working in this field, has, they have uh, explained us all the benefits that autonomous vehicles can uh, have to, can provide to us. Hmm? And then vehicles should be shared. They are, they are experts in this field, in autonomous vehicles, and also in mobility as a service, okay? So, if we have uh, shared cars, then the number, of, uh, the number of vehicles in the cities will decrease. This is good to decrease pollution also. Eh? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of new platforms that must be uh, developed and centralized. So the reality is that commuters now, they use, we use smartphones while using public uh, transport. We use applications, we are used, applica we are used to use applications to plan our, journey, our journeys. We use several kinds of micro-mobility devices, uh, scooters, hoverboards, and so on. So citizens more and more would share the data to get a better transport service also, and they more and more are using these alternative vehicles. So uh, we have a lot of ingredients to make this a reality. Mm? Now we have to develop uh, all these uh, possibilities so that mobility as a service becomes a reality, more and more expanded, okay? And now let me introduce our speakers. After the, the speeches of each one of them, then uh, we will have a, a period of questions and answers, okay? So our first speaker is Mr. Klaus Habas from Grenoble. He's the vice chair of the Council of Grenoble government. And well, he's this, uh, he's, uh, he has lived in France, in Germany, in Netherlands, and now he's at the Grenoble Alpes Metropolitan Council. He's working in the Grenoble Alpes Metropolitan Council. After that, well, our, his lecture is about carpooling, okay? That will going to be a reality only if it's part of the mobility as a service uh, reality. After him, we will have Jaume Barcelona. He's working now in the PTV group. We have uh, stands here from Grenoble, from PTV, from all of them. We have stands here in the conference. And now he's uh, the strategic advisor of the transport modeling uh, in PTV. He's also an emeritus professor at the Polytechnical University of Catalonia here in Barcelona. 
and he is very well known in the in the field of uh, transportation systems in the intelligent transportation systems he was the director of carnet also here in barcelona uh, which, which is an organization related to, tra to intelligent transport systems and his lecture is how do you establish mobility as a service here in the city of barcelona okay and last but not least, Mr. Billy Stalkup. He's uh, the president of this company, 360 Network Solutions in Atlanta. And he's an, an entrepreneur there. And uh, he has a lot of experience in smart traffic mobility, uh, giving solutions for these problems. Okay? His lecture is Embracing Mobility as a Community. So uh, we will enjoy their uh, speaks, and after that, we will manage uh, questions and answers. Okay. So our first speaker. speaker. Yeah. Monica, thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. Pleasure to talk here. As a as a green elected city leader, uh, I will address. Uh, a topic which is of, uh, I would say, short-time importance for practically every large city in the world. It's about carpooling. And carpooling is, of course, not existent today in Europe, inside urban areas. Not a, not a, it's a different for long-distance transport. Even when it comes to large industrial sites where it could be easy to organize 10,000 employees, just a few percent of these employees make use of carpooling to go from home to work and back home. And in global, we would like to change this, not only for big industrial sites, but generally. And the tool for this will be uh, carpooling. Will be mass as part with using, will be carpooling as part of a mass system. In global, we have a very dense public transport network. We have 450,000 inhabitants. A very efficient system with uh, 250,000 trips per day in public transport. And at peak hours, our trams and our buses are, of course, very full. And yet, it will take you about 60 minutes for the 10 kilometers on the right, on the left upper corner of this Google map, which is dark red. It will take you about 30 to 60 minutes to get to work, whilst our buses and trams are full. And this motorway, which is now dark red, is used by 100,000 vehicles a day. And in the morning, each vehicle is occupied in average by 1.06 persons. That means each vehicle drives three to four empty seats in downtown. And you can, of course, imagine it's much smarter to fill these seats than to, buy, than to build more trams or to buy more buses uh, in order to bring the people to work. And the potential for carpooling is indeed very high to reduce car congestion. But in order to make it work, and we believe we can make it work, you have to action three leverages. So we will start carpooling on that particular uh, area of the motorway where we will have what we call an easy win, because it's the most congested area in the city. The three pillars of carpooling we will like to use are first, infrastructure. We got the authorization by the government to put into place middle of next year, it's just in seven months, a high occupancy vehicle lane, in addition to the three existing lanes and the works are already underway. So there will be on the motorway one HOV lane, two normal lanes, and one lane for public transport. But that's not enough. In the US, we already have it, and Billy, we talked about it. Uh, we will in addition have pick up and drop off points at the, car, at the motorway entrance. And we will have uh, dedicated car parks at the motorway entrances. And that will be built very rapidly in the next two to three years. And the dynamic signaling uh, in order to um, actually uh, put this lane into service or out of service, depending on uh, the traffic situation. It's very important also that we have to police the use of a high occupancy vehicle lane. The technology to do this without a highway sheriff doesn't exist yet in Europe. So we'll develop this technology, and in the meantime, our highway sheriff will once in a while patrol on the motorway to enforce the correct use of that lane. But that's not enough. HOV lanes exist elsewhere. We will have a dedicated carpooling operator who will be appointed. Um, the RFQ is out by the end of this year, and um, 
we uh, will actually, uh, the operator will make it possible that the passenger of carpooling pays a fee and the driver, of course, has normally the win of gain of time. But the operator can uh, make possible that we integrate our mass um, system uh, so that a passenger who uses carpooling can then, for the same fee he paid, use public transport to complete his trip, or that the, P that the fee for the car park at the motorway entrance is already paid as part of the overall fee for his trip from A to B. We will anticipate to subsidize the operator, but as I said, it's important that we don't spend money on infrastructure, which will be ever more expensive, uh, which only reduces the traffic congestion by very little. So we will subsidize our operator at least at the beginning. And um, this is, of course, the most important element. We have to integrate our carpooling into mass. Uh, in Grenoble, we have taken the necessary steps, and it took us a lot of time in order to bring all types of transport under a single governance. We will have uh, in uh, public governance the uh, region, we will have uh, the cities, and that means we have all trains, all trams and buses, we have all public car parks, we will have carpooling, bike share, car sharing, and all this under a single governance, and by the middle of next year, we will start to roll out a mobility pass that will make it possible to pay for all these mobility services with a single click on your app. So we will, we will put into place within the next two years a system where you have on your mobile phone or on a card the choices between for mobility, immediately next to it the price, and then in a single step you make your choice and you book your trip and carpooling going from A will be part of it when you go from A to B, through the pickup stations or through prearranged uh, carpooling trips. And then, of course, we will uh, later on include uh, things like fl pa flexible passenger fees, yield management, and we will also include driver perks because when the motorway is empty, we still want the people to carpool because it's good for the environment. And when you could, for example, introduce uh, less parking fees on Saturday evenings, uh, in downtown, when our car parks are actually too full, but the motorway is empty. And then uh, we will, by this, try to uh, reduce the traffic even when there is little traffic. So, if you consider carpooling with an area of a city as, a, as an urban mobility system, you have to treat it like any other urban mobility. You have to integrate it into mass, fully integrated. And this is how we, in this holistic approach, try to differentiate ourselves from the Ubers of this world who just add carpooling with a system where you actually don't reduce the number of cars. It's still the same number of cars on the road. It's only the difference is that uh, you don't have to find a place where you to park your car, but the carbon emissions are the same. The congestion could be even more. So in our system, we would like to get rid of cars as fast as possible because it's clear that uh, in the real no zero carbon world of tomorrow, there is no place, and it was said by Monica, for your privately owned car, it will be shared. Whether it's electric or autonomous or not, we make the steps to at least go very fast to the shared car. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and uh, thank you very much for attending this session. Um, the, the topic we're going to deal is uh, with uh, the mobility as a service and an example of how this could be uh, introduced in a city like Barcelona. 
But uh, first, let me uh, ask a question, starting by uh, asking a question, which is uh, the type of city we would like to li live in? Because uh, most of our, our cities are cities not for citizens, are cities for the vehicles. So if you realize the, the, the share of the urban space is dominated by the urban space devoted uh, to vehicles. But maybe the city in which we would like to live will be a different city. It will be a, a city that will be a city for citizens. Though that means that uh, most of the urban space uh, will be uh, for citizens and not for the vehicles. So how can we achieve uh, this? One, one of the possibilities is just through the combination of uh, the technologies, not only the trends in automotive technologies, but also the ICT technologies that are enabling these uh, new types of mobility and also the societal changes that, that's uh, moving from uh, the uh, vehicle ownerships to the vehicle usage that are uh, uh, allowing, enabling the appearance of these new uh, mobility alternatives. And essentially, it seems that uh, if this is the future that is reachable, it will be like a, a combination of societal changes plus technology. And in this, uh, we will have the, the autonomous vehicles or the autobots. But uh, we have to, to, to take into account also the vehicles, the shared vehicles, and then the mass transit. We don't forget the, the public transport. Uh, in, in fact, uh, if we look at the, what the international the International Transport Forum recommends is a combination, a mixed combination of uh, transportation modes in which uh, the, uh, mo the, the shared uh, modes uh, will coexist with the transportation, the, the public transportation uh, systems such as we know, uh, we, we know now. Uh, that means that the public transportation system, buses, uh, metros, uh, railways, will become like a kind of backbone of the transportation system. And then the new trans uh, mobility uh, uh, trends then will be the feeders of uh, this uh, uh, transportation system. There are many studies of the International Transport Forum in different cities, the Lisbon, Helsinki, Auckland. The, the, I have put here just the, 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 the website in case you are interested in getting them. But uh, what is uh, also interesting is that uh, this is in perfect agreement with uh, what the uh, um, Union Internationale de Transport recommends. So they recommend how to combine uh, the different transportation modes and especially the new transportation modes in order that uh, these uh, uh, new mobility services become the feeders of uh, the public transportation uh, system. But. Uh, uh, to achieve this, we have to address different uh, scenarios. One uh, scenario is that uh, today we have uh, the, the current needs. E every city has to face the problems that uh, they have now, and they have to try to solve this. But uh, we are in an accelerated process in which uh, they are appearing new and new um, alternatives that are erupting. So no, no one called for them, no one planned them, but they are already here. Uh, you have, uh, for instance, the uncontrolled, quotation marks, uh, uh, penetration of the, uh, the, the shared services, like uh, uh, Uber, Lyft, or other uh, similar. But uh, also you have the eruption of the micromobility. The, uh, the, the shared uh, bikes, uh, the, the um, uh, electric uh, rollers, uh, the, uh, all this type of micromobility that they are erupting. And in cities like Barcelona, I assume that uh, for those who live in Barcelona, you are aware of that. And for those who are visitors, maybe you will have realized that the presence of these uh, new mobility uh, modes are, uh, is becoming more and more uh, important. So what that means, that at the same time that we try to solve the, the current problems, we have to face uh, these new problems. This uh, er er eruption, as I mentioned, of the uh, shared vehicles, the eruption of the new mobility services, but also looking into uh, the, the, at the relatively near future, how public transport could be reshaped due to the autonomous vehicles. That means uh, maybe a controversial view with respect to US, in which, uh, uh, if you realize, in Europe, we are thinking more on the use of public transport the, of, the, of the, the autonomous vehicles in public transport than for private uses. So how are we going to deal with this? So uh, the, and then, obviously, 
the, the, the key problem is not only to address the current situation, but also the short, medium term scenarios. That is the transition scenarios. Most of the studies, they present the current situation and the situation in uh, 2050. And that will be very nice for science fiction, 2050, but uh, the problems we have is which are the transition scenarios between the current situation and 2050. A possibility is just using modeling tools. And what I am going to, to, to mention very briefly is a, what, a tool that has been developed by PTB that is an engine or the, the is powered by a, a simulation model in Visum, and then they have built all the interfaces uh, for what? For instance, uh, to design the different type of experiments about the, the, the shared vehicles that you want to use. So, for instance, you de determine which is the type of fleets, the size of the fleets, the characteristics of the fleet, or also which could be the characteristics of the operation from the point of view of the passengers, of the users of the system, and from the point of view of the operator of the fleet. Then, in, in this way, uh, you can get uh, a different uh, uh, performance indicators that are useful uh, to design the system uh, to see which could be the level of satisfaction of the, of the, of the customer and also to assist the uh, authorities in determining which could be the regulations or the best regulations to operate the system in the win-to-win -win, uh, conditions that I mentioned before. Uh, let me very, very briefly show you, I hope it will work. This is a, 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 an animation of a, a, a simulation exercise of this type of tool. Uh, the different the, uh, colors of the, of the vehicles represent which is the, uh, the, the, the level of usage of the, of the vehicle, which is the number of uh, 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 passengers that are uh, currently using the vehicle. But I think that more interesting are the indicators that you have on the, on the right side of the, of the slide, in which you will see dynamically uh, how it's evolving over time, which is the amount of demand that is being serviced by the current fleet that has been defined for the experiment, which is the average level of use of the different vehicles and things like that. This is what enables the type of analysis that I mentioned before. Uh, just only to show you, uh, going a little bit farther, um, I, I present very briefly here uh, four uh, potential scenarios. One scenario will be the scenario of uh, the whole city uh, of Barcelona. And the other scenario will be uh, an, um, operating only in uh, the, the, the main downtown of Barcelona. Uh, order will be, well, Barcelona is a city that last year has had uh, 12 and a half million of visitors, so there are a lot of visitors that they are just uh, with a very limited time for sightseeing the city. So, which will be uh, the way of satisfying the needs of these visitors. And finally, something, if you remember what I mentioned before, See, if we have to feed uh, the public transport service, what happens for those areas, on the, those, that, those parts of the metropolitan area, what are poorly served by the current public transport system, the, for natural reasons of how the city has been spreading? Well, what you have here is the different uh, 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 numbers, the KPI uh, uh, indicators that are telling you for a given percentage of the demand, for instance, the tenth of percentage of the demand, with a fleet of 4,000 vehicles, which will be the degree of satisfaction, which will be the degree of uh, compliance. Then, uh, also, there is the possibility of changing the dimension. For instance, it's interesting. Uh, moving from 4,000 vehicles in the fleet to 3,000 vehicles, you satisfy and the 99.7% uh, 99 of the demand. Uh, what that means, uh, that uh, when you go to this performance indicator, uh, it's very interesting to, to, to be able of conducting this type of sensitivity analysis to see which are the operational limits of uh, your system. And then that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Billy Stalkup, and I'm very excited to, to be here at 2019's Smart City Expo World Congress. What a, what a fantastic conference this is, and, and what a beautiful city to, to host it in. Um, this, is, this is my third year here, and uh, it's something that I look forward to every year. 
but it's, it's a lot to take in and it's, and it's easy to get inundated by all the technology that's, that's being deployed and talked about and, and really showcased on the floor. Um, sometimes I, I actually ask myself, like, what, what is the smart city? What, what, is, what is my role in it? And, you know, if, am I looking for the next artificially intelligent, deep learning, market disrupting, elastic cloud computing, silo breaking, IoT embracing, resilient, sustainable technology? I try to get as many buzzwords in on that as, as possible. Um, but, but really, it's, it's so much more. And we're, we're trying to accomplish um, and overcome challenges that are centered around mobility, safety, environment, education, and, and economy. But what's at the core of, of everything that we're doing? Um, and as a community, we need to be focused on really improving the quality of life for our citizens. And putting the citizens as the, as the core focus um, is, is really what's, what's needed in our approach for smart cities. So today, I wanted to talk about two specific areas in the marriage of safety and security and mobility, and how when a community embraces these, um, it really allows for results to be, to be shared outside of just the city boundaries, and it really affects a community and its citizens at whole. Mobility and safety is there are, really cha there are real challenges that, that, are, that are present in this. Um, in the U.S. alone, over 36,000 people lost their lives last year. And across the globe, over 1.2 million people die every year in vehicle-related accidents. That's, that's a real challenge that, that cities face all across the world. Um, when we layer that on top of congestion and pollution and the environment, environmental impact, um, how do agencies overcome these challenges? So I, I want to take a look at three different approaches, which, which, uh, which we can talk about. Sure. Yes. So the first way is, is pilots. We all, we all are familiar with pilots. And this is a great way to identify economic and social value for, for, um, for cities. But the need is so much bigger than just doing a pilot. Um, We've all been involved and probably have, have been a part of that, of a pilot that, that lacks long-term vision and that sputters out after the first year. So this is, a, again, it's a great approach, but we need to be doing more and have more vision and a shared unified approach at this. Another approach is a private sector-led um, initiative. And this can be a great way um, to allow agencies to get to market faster and do something because the private sector can sometimes react and um, adapt quicker than the government. But this can also present conflicts down the road because the core focus can sometimes be skewed by and be centered around vendor revenue instead of losing, instead of being focused around the livability, around embracing the quality of life. So while it is a great way, it's, there, there are current conflicts that, that can be presented. The third approach I want to talk about is what happens when a community embraces a unified vision and allowing that impact to resonate across county, city, state lines. Um, and I, I want to share just a little bit about what the Georgia community is doing to embrace mobility and safety. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is, is how the city of Atlanta has really come together and within the fusion of public and private sector has begun to really tackle and seeing results that are, that are really making an impact. Across their smart quarters, we're seeing a 25% crash reduction. Um, this is a community that's embracing and, and tackling head on the, the challenges of mobility. But on top of that, reducing vehicle delay and emissions by 8.9%. These are really results. Secondly, we, we've been a part of a program with the Georgia Department of Transportation to provide automated incident management. In their program, within the first eight, um, nine months of deployment, uh, the program detected over 24,000 incidents across 94 lane miles and allowed first responders to, re to be able to respond by greater than eight minutes faster. Pedestrians in unsafe conditions, um, accidents on the roadways, if I can get a first responder there quicker or even one minute faster, that saves lives. And this has really driven um, some, some results that have, that have really affected and improved the safety around a community. Our Georgia community is also one of the largest connected vehicle infrastructure ecosystems. Um, enabling the infrastructure to support autonomous driving so we can increase 
and, and, and enable those, those safety operations. Focused on safety critical time sensitive mobility applications, we have over seven counties, 13 cities, but one unified commit community that's embracing this as, as a single shared vision. Again, just some staggering, staggering numbers to, to think about, but across the globe, over 1.2 million people lose their lives every year. I think a focused vision and, and a sharing of, of information um, is needed in a unified way. And, and I'll, and I'll kind of leave it with that um, and, and turn it back to, to, the, to the panel for some discussions. Okay, thank you very much. And now if you have any question. I've got one question prepared for each one of you. For uh, Klaus, I think that it's important, uh, yeah, the microphone. I think that it's important uh, that uh, we have to consider the age of the citizens. I mean, young people, they are willing to this uh, new uh, mobility as a service uh, concept, okay? But I wonder if uh, elder people will, will be um, uh, so willing to do that, no? For the change. Eh? So uh, I think that maybe governments or cities have to um, prepare a program to show people very easily to change their minds. So maybe it's very simple to young people but uh, for elder people, they are used to do things as they have done all their lives. So maybe change this aspect of using several services with an application, several modes with an application, maybe this is difficult for them, no? So have you in the cities, have you uh, think, thought about that and think on programs to do that so that all ages people uh, can benefit of this change? It's indeed an important consideration. We focus on home work computing, uh, commuting just because the people who are elderly normally are already retired. So home work com <laughs> commuting mostly addresses people who are under the age of 65 or very often under the age of 60. Um, and on the other hand, indeed, it, it would be a big mistake to make everything smartphone and up driven. Our mobility pass will be initially based on a card. And that's important because uh, 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 there are about 10 to 15 percent of the people in our city who would be excluded from public transport if it were only smartphone driven. Uh -huh. So it will be a card. And what's even more important, we have a big debate whether public transport should not be free of charge. That means that you don't need a card at all. At the moment we cannot afford it, but there is a debate. Roads used to be free of charge if there are no private cars anymore. Yeah. Uh, and if there is infrastructure provided publicly to bring you from A to B through mass, then why not have it free of charge, at least for some people, for example, the elderly? So it's, there's no answer yet. There are some cities like Dunkerque in France who introduce free public transport. Others in Italy, like Bologna, who, who, who take it back into, into a payment system. But we are very open to this aspect of uh, making public transport accessible to everybody by actually making it free of charge. Thank you. Interesting. There's a question, the microphone here. Um, I also have a question regarding carpooling, uh, because maybe I just didn't get it, but how do you, are you planning to put people in contact? Is it with people that know each other and around themselves, or will there be an on online platform? What is the incentive and how people are going to connect to each other? Both modes are, should be possible. One is the uh, pre-arrangement, and that is typically done either by, because you work at the same place uh, or because you, um, uh, because, uh, you contact yourself via the app. Uh, and then, of course, the benefit will be for the driver to be faster at destination because he can use the lane. Uh, but the operator should also operate uh, the pickup and drop-off. And very important thing is that uh, we use the motor with 100,000 vehicles. So you can normally uh, be sure that if you drop off your vehicle at the car park at the motorway entrance, that if you have a 
pickup point and a drop-off point next to a tram or bus stop that you just wait for a couple of uh, seconds or minutes and you are taken by a car that then uses the carpool lane. We have, we have made model calculations um, because well, we have experts in modeling here um, on the panel. We have made model calculations and we have analyzed that the flux on the motorway entries is sufficient to provide spontaneous pickup for carpooling. Another question over there? Hello, my name is Eduard, and I have two questions, and this goes for the whole panel. So the first one is uh, regarding the vehicles, okay? Um, we, we have talked about uh, electric vehicles, but there, there is also another kind of vehicles, which is the hydrogen cell uh, vehicles. Um, I haven't heard about that. Um, I would like to know about uh, if it is going to, to implement in some cities or um, if we will see them in the future. Um, also, there is another question, and it is regarding public transport. Um, uh, OK, um, there is um, another kind of transport that uh, has been implemented in some cities, and is the fl uh, flying uh, vehicles. Um, it has been implemented in, uh, in public uh, transport, and I would like to know also if it will be implemented in some cities or, or if it uh, is uh, in, uh, well, in, if we will see in the future. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, uh, with respect to the the, the, with respect to the, 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 the type of fuels in the, in the vehicles, whether electrical or biofuels or other type of fuels, uh, I, I have not explicitly addressed this in the, in the sense that uh, uh, the, 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 the way in which you, you model uh, a system like the one I have presented, uh, this is only uh, an additional question. It's not the essence. So the, the essence is when you have a, re a service request, how do you decide which is the vehicle in the fleet that is going to provide the service, which are the characteristics of the service, and things like that. But obviously, uh, the, the, what maybe for the, the message could be that uh, um, if we move into the direction of the sustainability, the sustainability for me has uh, two components. Uh, one component is uh, the component, uh, the technological component, and the other is the non-technological component. The technological component is the, the one that will be uh, referring to the type of uh, automotive technology and I include the, the, the different types of fuels in, in, in this consideration, while I have tried to, uh, to address the other aspect. The other aspect is how do you organize and, uh, this service and this mobility that is not uh, strictly uh, uh, technologically dependent. But this is something that you can add uh, into, your, into the model in order, for instance, to see the same, the same mobility as a service can be provided by a um, conventional vehicle or by an electrical vehicle. Uh, then in, in, the, in that case, uh, you can uh, measure which would be the difference in terms of emissions and things like that. Uh, this is uh, one aspect. And uh, with respect to, uh, I have mentioned uh, and the, the public transport service, but uh, I have made reference to the mobility as a service, that's uh, uh, this type of complementary, uh, the new mobility modes as uh, uh, combined with the public transport service. So the, say, uh, the way I see, and maybe is a little bit you can say Eurocentric, that means from the European perspective, is that in the big metropolitan areas, still, as I mentioned before, the, the backbone, the skeleton of the, of, the, of the mobility will be provided by the public transportation system, as we know, uh, metros, railways, and things like that. Then there could be many other varieties of uh, uh, public transport systems. For instance, uh, you can consider that some varieties of demand responsive transport systems could be considered one of the alternatives of the mobility as a service. Let me, well, you have here the, the, the booth of the, the, the public transport company in Barcelona that is presenting the results of uh, using uh, micro buses uh, for providing this type of the on-demand services. 
So I think that there is a wide variety of alternatives to do that. So thank you very much to close. No, just, the just uh, sorry. Oh, there's another question. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, just one, one short remark. Uh, we do indeed have a large experiment with hydrogen-powered cars in Grenoble, but there is no business model yet where safety has not been addressed. And for the flying car, I'm up for election in five months. If I promise my citizens flying saucers, uh, I don't think that's something on which I will be elected. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, Billy? I think, I think they summed it up pretty well. I think we're enabling infrastructure now to support autonomous vehicles. We'll see that first in um, transit uh, to reach. We're, we're involved with projects right now that, that have seen these, these transit vehicles uh, completely autonomous. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know how to answer the, the flying cars. Maybe, possibly. Yeah, and it's also interesting the thing that uh, Jaume has pointed out, and that also worries you, what happens in the transition, no? Because Billy assumes that vehicles are connected, no? To, for the sake of road safety, but what happens when vehicles are getting connected, but not all of them? So you can avoid a crash if, if perfectly, if all the vehicles are connected, all their brake. But what happens in one of them is not smart, and the, and the vehicle doesn't brake, no? So in the transition, we have to face all these, these problems. And I, furthermore, I would say that it's, it's important that, uh, not, not only that vehicles are electrical, but also which is the source of the energy. So we <laughs> hope that en the energy is renewable, re renewable no? Re renewable, renewable? <laughs> so green energy we need. So also the, the, the energy providers should be aware of our uh, issues, so the issues of the citizens, and they should uh, announce that so that we can select the energy providers depending on the, the, the source of the energy. Eh? This is also very important. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, all of you. And uh, enjoy the rest of the Congress. Thank you.